So I wanted to talk principally because this has been a very controversial area for those of us who interact uh, quite a bit with our primary care uh, colleagues. And this talk is going to be based in large part on two papers. This one, the 2017 release from ACCAHA in combination with a lot of other organizations that you see listed there, the guideline uh, on hypertension. And this uh, uh, guideline released by ACP uh, and AAFP, so the primary care physicians, which was released slightly before um, uh, before the ACCAHA guidelines and has led to a substantial amount of confusion and sometimes outright conflict. And I want to try and clarify some pieces on that um, historically. And I, I, one comment to make, if you've read these guidelines, they're very different. Um, some differences in terms of recommendation that I'll review with you, but they're different documents as well. The ACCAHA document is a very comprehensive document that reviews not just treatment uh, pharmacologically, but non-pharmacologic treatment, evaluation of hypertension, refractory hypertension, types of hypertension. And the AAFP ACP document is a, is a much more concise document, for better and for worse, that talks about treatment in a uh, very uh, smaller group. So we'll talk about that a bit. But before we do this, let's do a quick quiz for you. Uh, the first is JNC8 guidelines suggested keeping systolic blood pressure less than 150. These are true false. Second is ACCHA uh, 2017 guideline defines normal as less than 140 over 80. And the third is ACCAHA guidelines are dramatically different from those from the primary care groups. And we'll come back to those in a moment. So here's going to be the answer to the first. And I'll have to tell you a quick um, a vignette. But this paper published um, uh, in 2014 uh, started a little bit of the controversy. And here's the quick history. Up until 2013, the hypertension and hyperlipidemia guidelines were out of the uh, uh, of NIH. They were controlled by NIH. In 2013, their hypertension and lipid guidelines had been presented back to NIH to be, to be ratified by NIH as guidelines, and that included the JNC-8 guideline. Now, in an abbreviated fashion, I'll tell you, NIH was a little uncomfortable, and they actually went to ACC and AHA and asked for a review of those guidelines. And a number of us, some of us in the room, were actually reviewers of those two documents. And we went back to NIH and we said, we feel a bit uncomfortable. These are great documents. We think they need to be tweaked. At which point in time, and this is simply history, NIH said, we're done with these guidelines, and they turned them over to a ACC and AHA at that time. That's what happened. ACC and AHA went to the uh, lipid guideline group and said, will you work with us to, re to reward it? And they said, great idea. And we did, and that was published in 2013. The hypertension group said, no, we're really pretty comfortable with our findings, and they submitted it to JAMA, and that was this paper that you see up there. That's the title of which is Guideline. So here's where the controversy comes in. Is this a guideline or is this a paper? So this was the JNC work group paper and their recommendation for a guideline, but it was never ratified by NIH as a guideline, and it was not ratified by ACC, AHA, or any other organization. So this wasn't a ratified guideline. This is a great paper and really scholarly written, but it was never adopted as a guideline by NIH. It was never, so it was not the JNC-8 guideline. It was a paper written by the JNC-8 guideline writing group. And so just, uh, just FYI. But it did create a lot of discussion, and it still is. So part of uh, what happened with ACC and AHA was uh, based on this, the largest uh, uh, trial of hypertension that was ever done in terms of randomization. And again, funded by the government, the, the SPRINT trial with almost 10,000 patients uh, looking uh, at treating to a systolic to 120. If you read the paper, they didn't quite make that, but that was the goal. And the composite outcome you see there was MI, other uh, ACS, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular cause. 
and uh, the curves took a little bit of a little bit of time to uh, separate. But you see, there's roughly a 25% reduction in event in event rates um, uh, in the treatment group with a target of 120 in this cohort. Now, that came at a cost, and I've just shown you one of the costs there, that is uh, GFR, which fell, but there also was more hypotension, there were more electrolyte disturbances, there were, there were problems. So it wasn't, it's not, a free, it's not a free ride. If you treat to that, you're going to have some problems, and that was pointed out as well. What about old people? What about frail people? Because that's one of the concerns, and it was one of the concerns in the ACP AFP document. And here are the curves looking at fit versus less fit or frail. And there was an advantage shown even in the frail group. But again, there's, there is some cost associated with this. So one of the, I thought, thoughtful commentaries uh, that uh, uh, came out was this, that um, uh, Ninety percent of the sprint patients were already being treated. There was no nobody with diabetes. It was purposefully excluded, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And the reduction in heart failure drove most of the benefit. So it was mainly from a reduction in heart failure, and there were side effects. So again, this was not a cost-free reduction in blood pressure. And the reason I'm telling you this is, remember, these are guidelines. These are not laws. These help us treat, but we need to utilize the art of medicine and individualized therapy as we're thinking about how these guidelines work. So what about the diabetes issue? This is the ACCORD trial, very important, where a sm somewhat smaller trial, but still a large trial, looking at type 2 diabetes, and again, treating to a target of 120. Primary uh, outcome, very, very similar. Mean follow-up, 4.7 years. And now look what happens. All of a sudden, you don't get that same robust 25% uh, reduction in event rate with diabetics, which seems kind of odd, doesn't it? This seems like it would be a higher risk group, but in fact, you didn't see the same thing in Accord that you did in Sprint. Part one of the reasons for a substantial amount of the confusion. And there was, importantly, no statistically significant uh, benefit from intensive therapy. There was a hazard ratio that uh, was down, but it was not significant. And it didn't justify treatment. But on the other hand, as some people pointed out, it didn't completely exclude the possibility there was benefit. But it, it, from an intention to treat uh, standpoint, uh, Accord was negative. So how do we compare? Well, uh, 4,700 uh, 4, versus 9,400 patients, follow-up 4.7 years, Sprint was, th was shorter. Diabetic patient, non-diabetic patient. And look at the difference, 12% reduction in event, but it didn't reach statistical significance. But there's a trend, maybe a signal, maybe. Um, and then a 25% reduction. Was this sample size, if Accord had been 9,000 patients, would it have shown statistical difference? I, I don't know the answer, but these are, one, these are questions that have been raised by people who uh, have evaluated these carefully, and there was a surprisingly low event rate in Accord. So again, a trend in Accord, not statistically significant as it was in Sprint. What about meta-analysis? And again, careful, uh, those in the room that are much more sophisticated than I will tell you that you've got to be careful. These are heterogeneous populations often, and you have to be careful about making decisions. But again, there's a signal here that reduction to lower levels generally is associated with lower event rates. There, um, and in these, this particular meta-analysis sprint was uh, actually excluded. So there's a tendency, at least, that favors lower blood pressure statistically. And again, that drove a lot of the uh, decisions that were made in the ACC AHA document. So what happened uh, in the uh, ACC AHA guideline? Normal was less than 120 over 80. There's the answer to the second question. Elevated blood pressure was between 120 and 130. And stage one hypertension began at 130, talking just about systolic for a moment. And stage two is greater than 140. So compared to the old guidelines, this was a nomenclature change. So normal less than 120, hypertension actually beginning at 130, stage one. And here's the difference in the nomenclature, just quickly, with JNC7 
didn't put J and C8 up there for the reasons we discussed. And this does result in a reclassification in the United States of the prevalence of hypertension and the number of people based on those on the verbiage that I just gave you. Not always the treatment, because if you look at the changes in treatment, it's a fraction of these numbers that I'm showing you. So this is probably the easiest slide if you really want a guideline to how the ACCAHA uh, guidelines recommend treatment. So if you're, uh, if you're 120, that's normal, promote healthy lifestyle. If you're 120 to 129, it's non-pharmacologic therapy. So they're talking about elevated blood pressure, but not medicines. And then I would draw your attention in particularly to this part right here. That is stage one hypertension. So these are people that are defined as hypertension, but are still considered low risk, a low risk cohort. And the treatment is non-pharmacologic. So even though these are stage one hypertension, the recommendation importantly from ACCHA is that these are people that should be counseled with regard to lifestyle management, not put on medication. Now, if they have risk factors, if they have clinical cardiovascular disease or an increased cardiovascular risk using the standard risk calculator we heard earlier, there is a recommendation to, to add uh, uh, medication. But the quick message here is if you're under that 140, that really the treatment most of the time is non-pharmacologic. So blood pressure goal uh, for those with known CVD is um, uh, less than 130 uh, and treatment uh, without additional risk factors, uh, 130 may be uh, uh, reasonable, reasonable. And here's just a quick tour going rapidly about some of the things you can look at the guideline. Weight loss, healthy diet, particularly the DASH diet, reduced sodium intake, some controversy there. Enhanced so, uh, potassium intake, physical activity, and moderation of alcohol, a bad thing to talk about while we're in Napa, perhaps. <laughs> this is important um, uh, and is not for a, uh, a comparison, but this is really an important, uh, I think, um, a key vignette for all of us. That is, if you've got a patient uh, that has significant elevation, 20 uh, millimeters of systolic pressure higher, that is stage two hypertension. The current class one recommendation is don't start with monotherapy. This is really different for the, for the cohort in the room that is my generation or close to that because we were taught specifically, Paul, you're nodding your head, you and I were taught the same. Start with one agent, maximize the dose, then go to two agents, maximize the dose, blah, blah, blah. That is not scientifically valid based on review of data, and it's not in the guidelines. You get better effects with less side effects using lower doses of two antihypertensives in stage two hypertension. If you don't remember anything else from this talk, please remember this. So if somebody comes in and they're 150 over 100, and they're naive to antihyper uh, to antihypertensives. Please put them on non-pharmacologic management, and please put them on two lower dose agents rather than one. That's class one indication. Um, monitor outpatient. Uh, I'll skim through this quickly. Now, this is important. If you're elderly, unfortunately, this is me now. You're over 65. Uh, treatment is still recommended less than 130, but you need to use judgment. Drop down to that second group. High burden of comorbidity, problems with uh, orthostasis or easy falls, limited life expectancy, clinical judgment, patient preference. You need to look at these patients very critically and decide in this individual patient, do I really want to treat to that 130 or, or even trying to get them down to 120 and perhaps not in that cohort. So this is important because notice that in this guideline, they start saying at, one, at, at age 65, be careful. This is the ACCAHA document. By the way, renal artery stenosis, medical therapy is recommended except for refractory. This is different than what we used to do. We'd see renal artery stenosis and hypertension. 
we put in stents, and as you know from the data, that does not always work. And sleep apnea, we treat, but we don't know that it reduces the blood pressure. So key points, target is less than 130 over 80, especially at risk. Non-pharmacologic therapy, uh, unless they're at, the, or at low risk, two, two agents in stage two, monitor out of a hospital because you see a lot of variation. Caution in older adults, medical therapy is first line for uh, renal artery stenosis. Atherosclerotic, that's different than fibromuscular. So here's the difference, really, in summary, it's a 10 millimeter difference in some nomenclature. So a ACC AHA talks about adults, not sure what that is. Um, uh, ACP AAFP talks about greater than equal to 60 year olds. Their document is limited to 60 year olds and above. Non-pharmacologic treatment for less than 140 in the ACC doc, ACCHA document, non-pharmacologic uh, therapy was not directly addressed. It was indirectly addressed in the ACPAAFP document. Treatment with medication at 140 versus 150, there's the 10 millimeter difference, so we're arguing about 10 millimeters. And 130 with risk, 140 at risk in the uh, primary care document. So here's the quiz. GNC8 guidelines suggested keeping systolic less than 150. I, I'm, uh, I, I'm a nitpicker. The answer is no, because it wasn't really a guideline. Uh, guideline uh, 2017 normal was 120 over 80, not 140 over 80, and dramatically different, and I would say it's 10 millimeters. And if you look at that older age population, there's a hedge. So don't get into a big fight with the primary care people about this. Thank you very much. Thank you.